Part Four of the Island of Doctor Moreau, the Crying of the Man. As I drew near the house, I saw that the light shone from the open door of my room, and then I heard coming from out of the darkness at the side of that orange oblong of light, the voice of Montgomery shouting, "Prendick!" I continued running. Presently, I heard him again. I replied by a feeble hello, and in another moment had staggered up to him. "'Where have you been?' said he, holding me at arm's length, so that the light from the door fell on my face. "'We have both been so busy that we forgot you until about a half an hour ago.' He led me into the room, and sat me down in the deck-chair. For a while I was blinded by the light. "'We did not think you would start to explore this island of ours without telling us,' he said. And then, "'I was afraid. But what?' Hello. My last remaining strength slipped from me, and my head fell forward on my chest. I think he found a certain satisfaction in giving me brandy. For God's sake, said I, fasten that door. You've been meeting some of our curiosities, eh? said he. He locked the door and turned to me again. He asked me no questions, but gave me some brandy and water and pressed me to eat. I was in a state of collapse. He said something vague about his forgetting to warn me, and asked me briefly when I left the house and what I had seen. I answered him as briefly, in fragmentary sentences. "'Tell me what it all means,' said I, in a state bordering on hysterics. "'It's nothing so very dreadful,' said he. But I think you have had about enough for one day. The puma suddenly gave a sharp yell of pain. At that he swore under his breath, I'm damned, said he, if this place is not as bad as Gower Street with its cats. Montgomery, said I, what was that thing that came after me? Was it a beast, or was it a man? If you don't sleep tonight, he said, you'll be off your head tomorrow. I stood up in front of him. What was that thing that came after me? I asked. He looked me squarely in the eyes and twisted his mouth askew. His eyes, which had seemed animated a minute before, went dull. From your account, said he, I'm thinking it was a bogle. I felt a gust of intense irritation, which passed as quickly as it came. I flung myself into the chair again pressed my hands on my forehead. The puma began once more. Montgomery came round behind me and put his hand on my shoulder. "'Look here, Prendick,' he said. "'I had no business to let you drift off into this silly island of ours. But it's not so bad as you feel, man. Your nerves are worked to rags. Let me give you something that will make you sleep. That will keep on for hours yet.' You must simply get to sleep, or I won't answer for it. I did not reply. I bowed forward and covered my face with my hands. Presently he returned with a small measure containing a dark liquid. This he gave me. I took it unresistingly, and he helped me into the hammock. When I awoke it was broad day. For a little while I lay flat, staring at the roof above me. The rafters, I observed, were made out of the timbers of a ship. Then I turned my head and saw a meal prepared for me on the table. I perceived that I was hungry, and prepared to clamber out of the hammock, which, very politely anticipating my intention, twisted round and deposited me upon all fours on the floor. I got up and sat down before the food. I had a heavy feeling in my head, and only the vaguest memory at first of the things that had happened overnight. The morning breeze blew very pleasantly through the unglazed window, and that and the food contributed to the sense of animal comfort which I experienced. Presently the door behind me, the door inward towards the yard of the enclosure, opened. I turned and saw Montgomery's face. "'All right,' said he. "'I'm frightfully busy,' and he shut the door. Afterwards I discovered that he forgot to relock it. Then I recalled the expression of his face the previous night, and with that the memory of all I had experienced reconstructed itself before me. 
Even as that fear came back to me came a cry from within. But this time it was not the cry of a puma. I put down the mouthful that hesitated upon my lips and listened. Silence, save for the whisper of the morning breeze. I began to think my ears had deceived me. After a long pause I resumed my meal, but with my ears still vigilant. Presently I heard something else, very faint and low. I sat as if frozen in my attitude. Though it was faint and low, it moved me more profoundly than all that I had hitherto heard of the abominations behind the wall. There was no mistake this time in the quality of the dim broken sounds, no doubt at all of their source, for it was a groaning broken by sobs and gasps of anguish. It was no brute this time. It was a human being in torment. As I realized this, I rose, and in three steps had crossed the room, seized the handle of the door into the yard, and flung it open before me. "'Prandick, man, stop!' cried Montgomery, intervening. A startled deerhound yelped and snarled. There was blood, I saw, in the sink, brown and some scarlet, and I smelt the peculiar smell of carbolic acid. Then, through an open doorway beyond, in the dim light of the shadow, I saw something bound painfully upon a framework, scarred, red, and bandaged, and then, blotting this out, appeared the face of old Moreau, white and terrible. In a moment he had gripped me by the shoulder with a hand that was smeared red, had twisted me off my feet, and flung me headlong back into my own room. He lifted me as though I was a little child. I fell at full length upon the floor, and the door slammed and shut out the passionate intensity of his face. Then I heard the key turn in the lock, and Montgomery's voice in expostulation. "'Ruin the work of a lifetime,' I heard Moreau say. "'He does not understand,' said Montgomery, and other things that were inaudible. "'I can't spare the time yet,' said Moreau. The rest I did not hear. I picked myself up and stood trembling, my mind a chaos of the most horrible misgivings. Could it be possible, I thought, that such a thing as the vivisection of men was carried on here? The question shot like lightning across a tumultuous sky, and suddenly the clouded horror of my mind condensed into a vivid realization of my own danger. CHAPTER Eleven, THE HUNTING OF THE MAN It came before my mind with an unreasonable hope of escape that the outer door of my room was still open to me. I was convinced now, absolutely assured, that Moreau had been vivisecting a human being. All the time since I had heard his name, I had been trying to link in my mind in some way the grotesque animalism of the islanders with his abominations. And now I thought I saw it all. The memory of his work on the transfusion of blood recurred to me. These creatures I had seen were the victims of some hideous experiment. These sickening scoundrels had merely intended to keep me back, to fool me with their display of confidence, and presently to fall upon me with a fate more horrible than death, with torture, and after torture the most hideous degradation it is possible to conceive, to send me off a lost soul, a beast, to the rest of their comus route. I looked round for some weapon. Nothing. Then, with an inspiration, I turned over the deck-chair, put my foot on the side of it, and tore away the side-rail. It happened that a nail came away with the wood, and, projecting, gave a touch of danger to an otherwise petty weapon. I heard a step outside, and incontinently flung upon the door, and found Montgomery within a yard of it. He meant to lock the outer door. I raised this nailed stick of mine and cut at his face, but he sprang back. I hesitated a moment, then turned and fled round the corner of the house. Prendick, man! I heard his astonished cry. Don't be a silly ass, man! Another minute, thought I, and he would have me locked in and as ready as a hospital rabbit for my fate. He emerged behind the corner, for I had heard him shout, Prendick! Then he began to run after me, shouting things as he ran. 
This time, running blindly, I went northeastward in a direction of right angles to my previous expedition. Once, as I went running headlong up the beach, I glanced over my shoulder and saw his attendant with him. I ran furiously up the slope, over it, then, turning eastward along a rocky valley fringed on either side with jungle, I ran for perhaps a mile altogether, my chest straining, my heart beating in my ears, and then, hearing nothing of Montgomery or his man, and feeling upon the verge of exhaustion, I doubled sharply back towards the beach as I judged and lay down in the shelter of a canebrake. There I remained for a long time, too fearful to move, and indeed too fearful even to plan a course of action. The wild scene about me lay sleeping silently under the sun, and the only sound near me was the thin hum of some small gnats that had discovered me. Presently I became aware of a drowsy breathing sound, the soughing of the sea upon the beach. After about an hour I heard Montgomery shouting my name far away to the north. That set me thinking of my plan of action. As I interpreted it then, this island was inhabited only by these two vivisectors and their animalized victims. Some of these no doubt they could pass into their service against me if need arose. I knew both Moreau and Montgomery carried revolvers, and, save for a feeble bar of deal spiked with a small nail, the merest mockery of a mace, I was unarmed. So I lay still there, until I began to think of food and drink, and at that thought the real hopelessness of my position came home to me. I knew no way of getting anything to eat. I was too ignorant of botany to discover any resort of root or fruit that might lie about me. I had no means of trapping the few rabbits upon the island. It grew blanker the more I turned the prospect over. At last, in the desperation of my position, my mind turned to the animal men I had encountered. I tried to find some hope in what I remembered of them. In turn I recalled each one I had seen, and tried to draw some augury of assistance from my memory. Then, suddenly, I heard a staghound bay, and at that realized a new danger. I took little time to think, or they would have caught me then, but snatching up my nailed stick, rushed headlong from my hiding-place towards the sound of the sea. I remember a growth of thorny plants with spines that stabbed like penknives. I emerged, bleeding and with torn clothes, upon the lip of a long creek opening northward. I went straight into the water without a minute's hesitation, wading up the creek, and presently finding myself knee-deep in a little stream. I scrambled out at last on the westward bank, and with my heart beating loudly in my ears, crept into a tangle of ferns to await the issue. I heard the dog, there was only one, draw nearer, and yelp when it came to the thorns. Then I heard no more, and presently began to think I had escaped. The minutes passed, the silence lengthened out, and at last, after an hour of security, my courage began to return to me. By this time I was no longer very much terrified or very miserable. I had, as it were, passed the limit of terror and despair. I felt now that my life was practically lost, and that persuasion made me capable of daring anything. I had even a certain wish to encounter Moreau face to face, and as I had waded into the water, I remembered that if I were too hard-pressed, at least one path of escape from torment still lay open to me. They could not very well prevent my drowning myself. I had half a mind to drown myself then. But an odd wish to see the whole adventure out, a queer, impersonal, spectacular interest in myself, restrained me. I stretched my arms, sore and painful from the pricks of the spiny plants, and stared around me at the trees. And so suddenly, that it seemed to jump out of the green tracery about it, my eyes lit upon a black face watching me. I saw that it was the simian creature who had met the launch upon the beach. He was clinging to the oblique stem of a palm tree. I grabbed my stick and stood up, facing him. He began chattering. You, 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 was all I could distinguish at first. Suddenly he dropped from the tree, and in another moment was holding the fronds apart and staring curiously at me. 
I did not feel the same repugnance towards this creature which I had experienced in my encounters with the other beastmen. You, he said, in the boat. He was a man, then, at least as much of a man as Montgomery's attendants, for he could talk. Yes, I said, I came in the boat, from the ship. Oh, he said, and his bright, restless eyes travelled over me, to my hands, to the stick I carried, to my feet, to the tattered places in my coat, and the cuts and scratches I had received from the thorns. He seemed puzzled at something. His eyes came back to my hands. He held his own hand out, and counted his digits slowly. One, two, three, four, five, five. I did not grasp his meaning then. Afterwards I was to find that a great proportion of these beast people had malformed hands, lacking sometimes even three digits. But guessing this was in some way a greeting, I did the same thing by way of reply. He grinned with immense satisfaction. Then his swift roving glance went round again. He made a swift movement and vanished. The fern fronds he had stood between came swishing together. I pushed out of the brake after him, and was astonished to find him swinging cheerfully by one lank arm from a rope of creepers that looped down from the foliage overhead. His back was to me. Hello, said I. He came down with a twisting jump, and stood facing me. I say, said I, where can I get something to eat? Eat, he said. Eat man's food now. His eye went back to the swing of ropes, at the huts. But where are the huts? Oh, I'm new, you know. At that he swung round and set off at a quick walk. All his motions were curiously rapid. Come along, said he. I went with him to see the adventure out. I guessed the huts were some rough shelter where he and some more of his beast people lived. I might perhaps find them friendly, find some handle in their minds to take hold of. I did not know how far they had forgotten their human heritage. My ape-like companion trotted along by my side, with his hands hanging down and his jaw thrust forward. I wondered what memory he might have in him. "'How long have you been on the island?' said I. "'How long?' he asked. And after having the question repeated, he held up three fingers. The creature was little better than an idiot. I tried to make out what he meant by that, and it seems I bored him. After another question or two, he suddenly left my side and went leaping at some fruit that hung from a tree. He pulled down a handful of prickly husks and went on eating the contents. I noted this with satisfaction, for here at least was a hint for feeding. I tried him with some other questions, but his chattering, prompt responses were as often as not quite at cross-purposes with my question. Some few were appropriate, others quite parrot-like. I was so intent upon these peculiarities that I scarcely noticed the path we followed. Presently we came to trees, all charred and brown, and so to a bare place covered with a yellow-white incrustation, across which a drifting smoke, pungent in whiffs to nose and eyes, went drifting. On our right, over a shoulder of bare rock, I saw the level blue of the sea. The path coiled down abruptly into a narrow ravine between two tumbled and knotty masses of blackish scoria. Into this we plunged. It was extremely dark, this passage, after the blinding sunlight reflected from the sulphurous ground. Its walls grew steep and approached each other. Blotches of green and crimson drifted across my eyes. My conductor stopped suddenly. Home, said he, and I stood in a floor of a chasm that was at first absolutely dark to me. I heard some strange noises and thrust the knuckles of my left hand into my eyes. I became aware of a disagreeable odor, like that of a monkey's cage ill-cleaned. Beyond, the rock opened again upon a gradual slope of sunlit greenery, and on either hand the light smote down through narrow ways into the central gloom. CHAPTER Twelve: THE SAYERS OF THE LAW 
Then something cold touched my hand. I started violently, and saw close to me a dim pinkish thing, looking more like a flayed child than anything else in the world. The creature had exactly the mild but repulsive features of a sloth, the same forehand and slow gestures. As the first shock of the change of light passed, I saw about me more distinctly. The little sloth-like creature was standing and staring at me. My conductor had vanished. The place was a narrow passage between high walls of lava, a crack in the knotted rock, and on either side interwoven heaps of sea-mats, palm-fans, and reeds, leaning against the rock, formed rough and impenetrably dark dens. The winding way up the ravine between these was scarcely three yards wide, and was disfigured by lumps of decaying fruit-pulp and other refuse, which accounted for the disagreeable stench of the place. The little pink sloth creature was still blinking at me, when my ape-man reappeared at the aperture of the nearest of these dens, and beckoned me in. As he did so, a slouching monster wriggled out of one of the places, further up this strange street, and stood up in featureless silhouette against the bright green beyond, staring at me. I hesitated, having half a mind to bolt the way I had come. And then, determined to go through with the adventure, I gripped my nailed stick about the middle and crawled into the little evil-smelling lean-to after my conductor. It was a semicircular space, shaped like the half of a beehive, and against the rocky wall that formed the inner side of it was a pile of variegated fruits, cocoa-nuts among others. Some rough vessels of lava and wood stood about the floor, and one on a rough stool. There was no fire. In the darkest corner of the hut was a shapeless mass of darkness that grunted, Hey! as I came in, and my ape-man stood in the dim light of the doorway and held out a split coconut to me as I crawled into the other corner and squatted down. I took it and began gnawing it as serenely as possible, in spite of a certain trepidation and the nearly intolerable closeness of the den. The little pink sloth creature stood in the aperture of the hut, and something else with a drab face and bright eyes came staring over its shoulder. Hey! came out of the lump of mystery opposite. It is a man! It is a man! gabbled my conductor. A man! A man! A five man! Like me! Shut up! said the voice from the dark, and grunted. I gnawed my coconut amid an impressive stillness. I peered hard into the blackness, but could distinguish nothing. It is a man, the voice repeated. He comes to live with us. It was a thick voice, with something in it, a kind of whistling overtone, that struck me as peculiar. But the English accent was strangely good. The ape-man looked at me as though he expected something. I perceived the pause was interrogative. He comes to live with you, I said. It is a man. He must learn the law. I began to distinguish now a deeper blackness in the black, a vague outline of a hunched-up figure. Then I noticed the opening of the place was darkened by two more black heads. My hand tightened on my stick. The thing in the dark repeated in a louder tone, Say the words! I had missed its last remark. Not to go on all fours. That is the law, it repeated in a kind of sing-song. I was puzzled. Say the words, said the ape-man, repeating, and the figures in the doorway echoed this, with a threat in the tone of their voices. I realized that I had to repeat this idiotic formula, and then began the insanest ceremony. The voice in the dark began intoning a mad litany line by line, and I and the rest to repeat it. As they did so, they swayed from side to side in the oddest way, and beat their hands upon their knees, and I followed their example. I could have imagined I was already dead and in another world. That dark hut, these grotesque dim figures, just flecked here and there by a glimmer of light, and all of them swaying in unison and chanting. Not to go on all fours, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to suck up drink, 
that is the law. Are we not men? Not to eat fish or flesh, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to claw the bark of trees, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to chase other men, that is the law. Are we not men? And so, from the prohibition of these acts of folly, on to the prohibition of what I thought then were the maddest, most impossible, and most indecent things one could well imagine. A kind of rhythmic fervor fell on all of us. We gabbed and swayed faster and faster, repeating this amazing law. Superficially, the contagion of these brutes was upon me, but deep down within me, the laughter and disgust struggled together. We ran through a long list of prohibitions, and then, the chant swung round to a new formula. His is the house of pain. His is the hand that makes. His is the hand that wounds. His is the hand that heals. And so on, for another long series, mostly quite incomprehensible gibberish to me about him, whoever he might be. I could have fancied it was a dream, but never before have I heard chanting in a dream. His is the lightning flash, we sang. His is the deep salt sea. A horrible fancy came into my head that Moreau, after animalizing these men, had infected their dwarfed brains with a kind of deification of himself. However, I was too keenly aware of white teeth and strong claws about me to stop my chanting on that account. His are the stars in the sky. At last that song ended. I saw the ape-man's face shining with perspiration, and my eyes being now accustomed to the darkness, I saw more distinctly the figure in the corner from which the voice came. It was the size of a man, but it seemed covered with a dull gray hair, almost like a sky terrier. What was it? What were they all? Imagine yourself surrounded by all the most horrible cripples and maniacs it is possible to conceive, and you may understand a little of my feelings with these grotesque caricatures of humanity about me. He is a five-man, a five-man, like me, said the ape-man. I held out my hands. The grey creature in the corner leant forward. Not to run on all fours, that is the law. Are we not men? he said. He put out a strangely distorted talon and gripped my fingers. The thing was almost like the hoof of a deer produced into claws. I could have yelled with surprise and pain. His face came forward and peered at my nails, came forward into the light of the opening of the hut, and I saw, with a quivering disgust, that it was like the face of neither man nor beast, but a mere shock of grey hair with three shadowy overarchings to mark the eyes and mouth. "'He has little nails,' said this grisly creature in his hairy beard. "'It is well.' He threw my hand down, and instinctively I gripped my stick. "'Eat roots and herbs. It is his will,' said the ape-man. "'I am the sayer of the law,' said the grey figure. Here come all that be new to learn the law. I sit in the darkness and say the law. It is even so, said one of the beasts in the doorway. Evil are the punishments of those who break the law. None escape. None escape, said the beast folk, glancing furtively at one another. None, said the ape man. None escape. See? I did a little thing, a wrong thing, once. I jabbered, jabbered, stopped talking. None could understand. I am burnt, branded in the hand. He is great, he is good. None escape, said the grey creature in the corner. None escape, said the beast people, looking askance at one another. For every one, the want that is bad said the great sayer of the law. What you will once we do not know. We shall know. Some want to follow things that move, to watch and slink and wait and spring, to kill and bite, bites deep and rich, sucking the blood. 
It is bad. Not to chase other men, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to eat flesh or fish, that is the law. Are we not men? None escape, said a dappled brute standing in the doorway. For every one the want is bad, said the grey sayer of the law. Some want to go tearing with teeth and hands into the roots of things, snuffing into the earth. It is bad. None escape, said the men in the door. Some go clawing trees. Some go scratching at the graves of the dead. Some go fighting with foreheads or feet or claws. Some bite suddenly, none giving occasion. Some love uncleanness. None escape, said the ape-man, scratching his calf. None escape, said the little pink sloth creature. Punishment is sharp and sure. Therefore learn the law. Say the words. And incontinently he began again the strange litany of the law. And again I and all these creatures began singing and swaying. My head reeled with this jabbering and the close stench of the place, but I kept on, trusting to find presently some chance of a new development. Not to go on all fours, that is the law. Are we not men? We were making such a noise that I noticed nothing of a tumult outside until someone, who I think was one of the two swine men I had seen, thrust his head over the little pink sloth creature and shouted something excitedly something that I did not catch. Incontinently those at the opening of the hut vanished. My ape-man rushed out. The thing that had sat in the dark followed him. I only observed that it was big and clumsy, and covered with silvery hair, and I was left alone. Then, before I reached the aperture, I heard the yelp of a staghound. In another moment I was standing outside the hovel, my chair-rail in my hand, every muscle of me quivering. Before me were the clumsy backs of perhaps a score of these beast-people, their misshapen heads half-hidden by their shoulder-blades. They were gesticulating excitedly. Other half-animal faces glared interrogation out of the hovels. Looking in the direction in which they faced, I saw, coming through the haze under the trees, beyond the end of the passage of dens, the dark figure and awful white face of Moreau. He was holding the leaping staghound back, and close behind him came Montgomery, revolver in hand. For a moment I stood horror-struck. I turned and saw the passage behind me blocked by another heavy brute, with a huge grey face and twinkling little eyes, advancing towards me. I turned and saw the passage behind me blocked by another heavy brute, with a huge grey face and twinkling little eyes, advancing towards me. I looked round and saw to the right of me, and a half-dozen yards in front of me, a narrow gap in the wall of rock, through which a ray of light slanted into the shadows. "'Stop!' cried Moreau, as I strode towards him. And then, "'Hold him!' At that, first one face turned towards me, and then others. Their bestial minds were happily slow. I dashed my shoulder into a clumsy monster who was turning to see what Moreau meant, and flung him forward into another. I felt his hands fly round, clutching at me and missing me. The little pink sloth creature dashed at me, and I gashed down its ugly face with the nail in my stick, and in another minute was scrambling up a steep side pathway, a kind of sloping chimney, out of the ravine. I heard a howl behind me, and cries of, "'Catch him! Hold him!' and the grey-faced creature appeared behind me and jammed his huge bulk into the cleft. "'Go on!' they howled. I clambered up the narrow cleft in the rock, and came out upon the sulphur on the west side of the village of the beast-men. That gap was altogether fortunate for me, for the narrow chimney, slanting obliquely upward, must have impeded the nearer pursuers. I ran over the white space and down a steep slope, through a scattered growth of trees, and came to a low-lying stretch of tall reeds, through which I pushed into a dark, thick undergrowth that was black and succulent underfoot. As I plunged into the reeds, my foremost pursuers emerged from the gap. 
I broke my way through this undergrowth for some minutes. The air behind me and about me was soon full of threatening cries. I heard the tumult of my pursuers in the gap up the slope, then the crashing of the reeds, and every now and then the crackling crash of a branch. Some of the creatures roared like excited beasts of prey. The staghound yelped to the left. I heard Moreau and Montgomery shouting in the same direction. I turned sharply to the right. It seemed to me, even then, that I heard Montgomery shouting for me to run for my life. Presently the ground gave rich and oozy under my feet. But I was desperate and went headlong into it, struggled through knee-deep, and so came to a winding path among tall canes. The noise of my pursuers passed away to my left. In one place three strange peak-hopping animals, about the size of cats, bolted before my footsteps. This pathway ran uphill, across another open space covered with white incrustation, and plunged into a cane-break again. Then suddenly it turned parallel with the edge of a steep-walled gap, which came without warning, like the ha-ha of an English park, turned with an unexpected abruptness. I was still running with all my might, and I never saw this drop until I was flying headlong through the air. I fell on my forearms and head among thorns, and rose with a torn ear and bleeding face. I had fallen into a precipitous ravine, rocky and thorny, full of a hazy mist which drifted about me in wisps, and with a narrow streamlet from which this mist came meandering down the centre. I was astonished at this thin fog in the full blaze of daylight, but I had no time to stand wondering then. I turned to my right, downstream, hoping to come to the sea in that direction, and so have my way open to drown myself. It was only later I found that I had dropped my nailed stick in my fall. Presently the ravine grew narrower for a space, and carelessly I stepped into the stream. I jumped out again pretty quickly, for the water was almost boiling. I noticed, too, there was a thin sulfurous scum drifting upon its coiling water. Almost immediately came a turn in the ravine and the indistinct blue horizon. The nearer sea was flashing the sun from a myriad facets. I saw my death before me. But I was hot and panting, with the warm blood oozing out on my face and running pleasantly through my veins. I felt more than a touch of exultation, too, at having distanced my pursuers. It was not in me, then, to go out and drown myself yet. I stared back the way I had come. I listened. Save for the hum of the gnats and the chirp of some small insects that hopped among the thorns, the air was absolutely still. Then came the yelp of a dog, very faint, and a chattering and gibbering, the snap of a whip, and voices. They grew louder, then fainter again. The noise receded up the stream and faded away. For a while the chase was over, but I knew now how much hope of help for me lay in the beast people. End of Part 4